Hi, my name is Francis Xavier Carnese Jr. and I'm known as Frank. And Frank, I want to ask you about the Carnese. Um, what do you know about your dad's family and, and uh, the name? Well, it's very interesting that you should ask that. Just this past year, um, my wife Loretta and I and uh, two dear friends returned to Sicily for a vacation, part of which was to visit um, the little town of Mezzayuso, which is in Sicily, which was the town of my father's ancestors. Um, when we arrived in this little town, uh, we were greeted uh, rather uh, stonily by the local inhabitants and were really ready to leave when uh, Loretta spotted a building that was a municipal building. And we entered the municipal building and uh, Loretta speaks Italian and indicated that this was the town of my ancestry. And people streamed out of all of these offices. We met the mayor of the, this uh, municipal area and um, he said, what was your, what is your name? And I said, it was Carnesi, C-A-R-N-E-S-I. -E it was changed when we came here. And he said, Carnesi, well, we have Carnesis that work right in this building. And in about five minutes, we not only had a sense of the derivation of the family tree, but I met uh, Vita Carnesi, who is my cousin. Never met her before in my life, didn't even know that this group of cousins existed. And um, with tears in our eyes, met this cousin that I did not even know before this. Um, it was very emotional, to say the least. Um, and uh, spent some time in this town overlooking the hills and, and the valleys that my ancestors came mm. from. Uh, it was a very... Uh, seminal moment in my life, if you will, to return there and to be uh, in and the actual area where my family was from. That was my father's side of the family. My mom's side of the family is from another little town in Italy uh, near Benevento, which we had visited previously. So now I have visited both the towns of my father's yes. ancestors and my mother's right. ancestors. Did your parents come to this country when they were uh, very young or were, they, were their ancestors born there and they were born here? My father was actually a third generation, second or third generation American. Oh, um, oh. And uh, his, wow. so they had been there a long time, a Connecticut, uh, in the area, uh, one area in Connecticut. Um, my mother's father and mother were both born in Italy and came here at very, very young ages, 13 okay. and 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, where did Frank, when, when did the family start calling you Frank or when did that begin? Do you have any idea? You've been talking to my mother. Not yet, <laughs> not yet. Um, when I grew up, uh, much along the lines of the song, um, a Girl Named Sue, my mom did not want me called Frank. She didn't want two Franks in the family, Dad. I'm okay. a junior. So it became Fran, which of course became Franny. Um, oh. That was not an easy name to yeah. grow up with. Yes. Um, and until Fran Tarkington emerged on the scene, it was, uh, it was quite a, um, burden. a burden to have to deal with that. Because every new kid that came into class, you know, when the guy came into class, I determined whether or not he was going to beat me up or I would be beating him up, depending on the size of the individual, you know, because it would be, and Francis or Franny, um, would you ask, answer yes, that question? Yes, and yes. then there was Francis the Talking Horse, and yes, Franny was yes, a girl's name, yes. so it was definitely a, a little bit, and until Mr. Tarkington helped me out, and I used to say prayers to him at night. <laughs> how many children were, uh, your father was one of how many siblings? My father was one of... Um, uh, three brothers. There were there were three uh, boys in his family. Uh, the oldest of which is still of whom is still alive. That mm -hmm. is my uncle Ted, oh. who is my godfather. He is um, lives in Oregon, um, and I have a whole cadre of cousins uh, out in Oregon. My cousin Greg, uh, my cousin Rosemary, my cousin Treese and her family. Um, it's an extended West Coast family. I have uh, um, a really good friend, Rich, who was um, was what was married to my uh, cousin Rosie, and um, that whole side of the family is out in the West Coast. My uncle Andy um, uh, was a person that I was very close to my entire life. Your father's um, brother. My father's brother, Andy, mm -hmm. and uh, he passed away the same day that wow. my father did. Wow. 
So yeah, upon hearing the news of my father's death, uh, my, my uncle passed away. So we had a dual burial. That was a very, oh. as you can imagine, a very tough thing to deal with. Um, and uh, you, your mother was also from, uh, uh, was she, she was not an only child, was no, she? No, my mom comes from a very large family. Um, and she, um, she uh, had, let me see now, there's, there were four brothers and three sisters. Um, one, two, three, four, four girls and three boys in her family. Um, and I still have a number of uh, uncles and aunts that are very, very alive and well. My Aunt Yolanda, uh, my Aunt Sylvia, um, my Aunt Louise has passed away. Um, I have an Uncle Enrico, uh, just lost recently mm -hmm. my Uncle Al and my mm -hmm. Uncle Ernie. But yeah. again, very large family, yeah. a lot of cousins. Um, on you know, spread out over the New York metropolitan area. And this is, uh, this is the generation that we, because of the age, we will be losing members of yes. the family now because we're, they're at that age and yeah. it's got to happen. Um, and what about your own family? I'm the oldest of uh, four children. I have three younger sisters. My sister, uh, Elvira, um, is in business in the um, Washington, D.C., uh, Virginia area, mm -hmm. and she has a daughter, um, my niece, Laura, who is married to a wonderful fella, Don, and uh, they have two girls, one of which I am the, uh, one of whom I am the godparent of, mm -hmm. and my sister, Carol, uh, lives upstate New York, and she has four children, and um, they're all in various stages of, in the business world, or entering mm -hmm. college, and being in college, and uh, in high school. Uh, my sister Natalie lives with my mom, upstate New York, um, and she's been involved in um, the business of being involved with horses all of her life. She's uh, trained and driven horses and uh, is uh, certified as a, a muscular therapist for equine mm -hmm. um, the muscular therapy and uh, has uh, been involved in that venture too. Very um, interesting. That's not a field that is probably very crowded with uh, well it's uh it's tough to get into the theory is that and it's an accurate one that just as any athlete um a horse will perform best when the muscles are not knotted and sure. when they are in their in their prime condition you know it's interesting we would never let a an athlete who is a um, a half back or a tight end go out in the field with a muscle pull, but we would send a mm -hmm. uh, a you know a, a racehorse uh, to go out to uh, a trot um, and maybe not Remarkable. be in the best of shape. Yeah. And my sister can spot that. Wow. You know, she's got the the hands can just yeah. manipulate and and put the horse in a in a much better position to be at their best. So that's a very interesting line of work that she's been involved in. Of your generation uh, of siblings. Are there any other educators, Frank? No. Okay. Uh, everybody else went off and did different things. Different things. What about now your family, your wife and... and well, before we move on, mom, yeah. I think importantly oh, yes. to say, um, was one of the strongest influences in terms of my life. She was a special education teacher I in New York City for many, many years. Um, uh, obviously, a lot of the techniques and ways that she had with her kids and the way she was the quote unquote always the teacher with us yes. you know um, always making rainy days into an interesting event whether it was to learn how to make beads out of macaroni or to you know find special words in the newspaper she was always the teacher um, and was um, very much of an inspiration in regard to the fact that um, she had dedicated her life to working with so many of the children that were in some cases, street urchins that had mm. been literally taken off the streets of New York. And Where did she work in New York? New York City, various areas. She worked oh. in Jamaica, uh -huh. Flushing. Uh, at one point, after my mom and dad and my sister moved upstate, she was um, teaching in some of the, the local residential schools that uh -huh. are still New York City schools, John, yes. but they're upstate New okay. York. So uh -huh. she was teaching oh, yes. in, in that kind of a venue uh -huh. and then uh, retired. Almost a therapeutic. Uh, right. Exactly. But mm -hmm. mom was substituting well into her 70s, being called into the local school district. And um, she's a multi-talented lady who speaks many languages. Um, and 
really amazing. She's, mm -hmm. she's fluent, and I would still say today, if someone tried to speak to her in Latin, they'd get an earful back, because she can still read, write, speak Latin, Italian, gets by in uh, Spanish, is fluent in French, and was just a tremendous source of uh, educational knowledge, as was my dad. My dad um, was very much a, a self-made man, uh, an entrepreneur. He was in his own business for years. And What uh, kind of business did he uh, Dad have? was in uh, several ventures, one of which he was originally a salesman. He was involved in um, uh, electrodynamic uh, computer type programs before they were even wow. uh, out there, so to speak. Um, and um, eventually went into a business uh, that he loved, that he was very, very close to in his heart, which was um, floral supply, including growing and uh, raising um, exotic plants that he sold to various uh, folks here on Long Island, which, believe it or not, is the tie-in in terms of how I ended up in Berkeley. You, your, this business was upstate then, I take nope, it. Nope, right here it on wasn't. Long Island. It was on Long Island. Yep, we were here okay. at the time living in Roslyn. And um, I was I had, was in the process of graduating from Niagara University in the spring of um, 1966. Um, I was engaged to be married. And I had a job already given to me in, um, which I had applied for, interviewed for, in uh, Plainfield, New Jersey. The engagement at the end of our college career kind of um, was a mutual parting of mm -hmm. the ways. It was mm -hmm. a long distance between where we were, et cetera. And um, I was helping my dad uh, deliver some materials to Towers Flowers here in Brentwood. Yes. And there was a gentleman in there ordering um, a bouquet of flowers for his wife's uh, birthday. Mm. And Mr. Towers knew me, and he liked me a lot. And he turned to this gentleman, and he said, Boy, if you had a brain in your head, this is a guy you should hook, because you could steal him from where he's already got a contract. And uh, this person turned around and said, What's your field? And I said, English. And he said, really? Um, how committed are you to this? I said, I just signed a pre-agreement letter. And he said, well, why don't you spend some, you, do you, do you um, to my father, do you have some other th things to do? And dad said, yeah, I've got to make deliveries. And this individual said, why don't you come with me? Um, that person was Ray Fournier. Okay. He took me to East Junior High School. I sat down at a table with three gentlemen, Ed Murphy, George Pittman, and Tom Marcello. They interviewed me for 15 minutes. Just like that. Ed Murphy said to me, you'd be interested in doing some things like the yearbook, um, directing the drama club, and <laughs> starting a literary <laughs> magazine? I said, yeah. Tom Marcello said to me, well, what do you consider to be, you know, the one thing that I said, I have to interrupt you. Um, you're going to ask me questions about discipline and things like that. I don't have discipline problems in a classroom. I handled the toughest kids that Gaskill Junior High School could offer. And our average young man in that school was 17 years of age in eighth grade. Most of the young ladies in that school were placed there by the courts. And I've dealt with, with some really tough situations. and. Um, I can assure you, I, I don't have discipline problems. It's not something that happens in my classroom. Um, they took me upstairs, and I walked into this classroom. Mr. Murphy and Mr. Pittman went into this room. It was 221, second floor of East Junior High School. I walked into the room, and Mr. Murphy had put my name on the board. And he turned to me, and he said, see this piece of chalk? I said, yep. He said, you want it? It's yours. So's the job, so's the room. Just like that. Just like that. And I turned back to him and I said, okay. Okay. This would have been what year, Frank? It was April of 1966. I was 21 years of age. Um, I turned 22 on May 22nd of that year, graduated from Niagara University. 
Um, and they offered you a contract for how much money that first year? $5,300. Mm -hmm. And it was more money than I ever remember having in my life. <laughs> I was able to give money to mom and dad, buy a new car, pay off my debt, get s debts, get clothes, um, and, and enjoy father, myself. And your father picked you up and you said, Dad, I got a job. I said, Dad, I'm going to be working in Brantwood. And they were ecstatic. Okay. Because the original plan um, included me leaving and not being home. Well, you know, in an Italian household, coming out of college doesn't mean anything other than you return home, which I did for a couple of years. Um, but they knew that the area that I had selected, Plainfield, was really a tough, tough area. Um, yeah. Not to say that Brentwood didn't have its reputation even yeah, then, exactly but Plainfield right. really, really was mm -hmm. a tough, tough area. And that's what I had really looked for and selected. I wanted right. to work with um, kids who really yes. might have the need for what I had experienced at Gaskill, um, a, a population that was really, really um, needy. Needy and very, very um, mixed in terms of its ethnic mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. racial mm -hmm. backgrounds and kids who really had not. Well, you found it. No, well, I did. Yeah. And it found you. Yes. Frank, let's go back for a moment, and I wanted to ask you about Loretta, your wife, and, sure. and, and, the, and your own family. Yep. T t talk about them a little bit. Well, that's even, again, when we talk about destiny. Uh, I started out as an English teacher, John, 1966, 1967, 1968. Mm -hmm. Ed Murphy and Tom Marcello had come to me and said, you're here till incredible hours. You're out in the community working with the families. We're going to have an opening in terms of guidance. You have to get a master's degree. We want you to pursue a master's degree in guidance. I said, fine. I did that. And as I was as we were able to in, in those days, even though you were not totally certified, when you were on the way to being certified, they could hire you. And in um, the fall of 19, that summer of 1968, Mr. Pittman came to me and he said, I'm going to take you out of the classroom. We're going to hire you as a guidance counselor. I want you in my guidance office. And I began my career as a guidance counselor at East. Several years later, um, 1969, 70, right around there, um, I had a young lady in my caseload who um, proved to be quite a handful. And I told my secretary to make an appointment with a social worker from the uh, county who was in charge of this young lady. And uh, two days later, um, I met this um, Loretta, who mm. was the social worker in that case. Um, we became obviously interested in each other. And um, the following June, we were married. So I met her through being here at Brentwood. Kismet. Um, Kismet. Yes. Okay. And, and my family includes um, uh, one of the most precious gifts God has given me is my son, Adam. Um, he is... Um, a joy. He has been everything that a father could ask for. Um, he's presently em employed uh, in New York City uh, by K&E, uh, one of the largest law firms, Kirkland and Ellis. Um, he's not a lawyer. He's an operations manager. Um, he lives in the city um, and is happily involved in many activities in the city, uh, a lot of cultural stuff, and uh, uh, just a great kid. Everything that you could ask for in a son. Great, great. And uh, at home now is Loretta and yourself. Yes, and two okay. um, yeah. additions to the family. Recently we have a two, two brothers, twins, two and a half year old um, labs uh, <laughs> <laughs> that are um, capable of keeping us uh, very, very busy. Uh, Tawny and Thunder are uh, quite a uh, handful um, and uh, lots of fun for us. I wanted to ask you about, if you look back over, the, you've, you've described an extended family with, uh, with a great many people over a wide geographic area. Are there certain talents or interests or abilities that you see reflected generation to generation or, or qualities that you see keep popping up uh, as you look at family? I even, think even with Adam, even with your son, you. Well, 
I think if I if I look through the the generations, just in terms of Adam, mm. myself, and for example, my mom and my dad, I think the concept of being interested in, and and Loretta is too, um, we're interested in theater. Oh. Okay, we're interested in in uh, languages. We're interested. Loretta speaks um, three or four languages too. So I mean, it's like you know, um, she she can she's uh, got a master's in French. She's totally fluent in. Uh, in French, she speaks Italian, can get by in Spanish. Um, Adam does very well in several languages, I think enough to just make himself, you know, understood. Um, he has extensively traveled through Europe on mm. several occasions, uh, spent part of his uh, college career in London um, and uh, traveled throughout various areas of Europe um, with some friends. Mm. I think one of the things that I can say to you is is probably something that I would would be able to say is kind of like almost a um, a theme. I think that um, there's a real sensitivity towards um, other people and the ability to communicate. Um, Adam is a great planner. He's a great uh, organizer. He's a problem solver. How old solver. is Adam now? Adam is 24. Okay. okay he's going to be 25 on April 19th. Um, and the kind of work that he does is is exactly that. He's the problem solver. He's the organizer. He's the one that has to, uh, you know, think ahead. Um, and uh, that that was something that was that I think is there. I think the ability to be there for people. Um, Mom is a real people person. Always has been. So is Dad. He loved people. Um, loved to be with them. Um, a good argument. Um, a good debate conversation at the dinner table was always filled with um, perspective in terms of what was going on in the world and what was going on in terms of the arts or the theater. Um, you know, there was a real sense of affinity for the, for the world of music. My Uncle Andy was um, an opera buff par none. I mean, they, they finally asked him, okay, stop answering the questions on the Texaco Hour. We'll give you 20 albums. You pick them. Stop calling in because we know that you'll win. Um, and they did. They brought him out. They told him, don't call in any more answers. Um, my Uncle Ted is a, a, an extraordinarily knowledgeable man in terms of um, opera. And my cousins are. We were all interested in the world of theater and arts. And Adam uh, will just as easily say yes to us to go see a play um, and the movies. Loretta and I go to the movies a lot. We're interested in, in that genre, too. And uh, the world of literature. Where were you born? Are you born in the city? I think what would probably be considered to be a um, the, the kind of a progression that a lot of folks did from um, the very, very ethnic areas of, of the Italian enclaves in the Brooklyn uh, okay. community, um, we the family moved um, from um, Brooklyn to Jackson Heights, Queens. Where in Brooklyn were you? Um, we were in um, the the first area that they were in was, I believe, in the the Bay Ridge area of Brooklyn. Okay, um, Bay Eighth and that kind of an area, um, and trying to think of the name of one of the streets, but it won't come to me. Cropsy? Uh, no, it no. was another area of Brooklyn. Um, okay. Because there was a progression of houses okay. that oh, uh, okay. my, my grandmother and my grandfather had in Italy, uh, in, uh, in Little Italy. And then um, I was... Uh, You're talking about in Little Italy in Manhattan? No, in no, the in, little in, communities in Little Italy in Brooklyn. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, th I was born in Brooklyn. Shortly thereafter, the family moved to Jackson Heights. Okay where my sister, two of my sisters um, were born, and then to Roslyn in Nassau County, mm -hmm. where I basically grew up. Um, and would your earliest childhood memories be of Brooklyn, or would they be subsequent? Jackson Heights. Jackson Heights. What, what, what are some of the earliest things you remember? <sighs> the, the world consisted of the square block that was bounded by um, 93rd Street and 94th Street, um, 35th Avenue, and the Boulevard, and all of the houses, the, the apartment buildings therein. We weren't allowed to cross the street unless we were viewed by mom from the fourth floor apartment 
window, and that was to cross the street to where Blessed Sacrament Church was. So the school and the church were right across the street. But where we were allowed to play and where we were allowed to hang out, quote unquote, as this young, this is up until the end of, or the middle of third grade, was within that block. And that was an entire, entire world unto itself. And there was a, a program thing that we all did. If it was time of the year for marbles, it was marbles. If it was bottle tops, it was bottle tops. If it was um, ring alivio, it was ring alivio. Whatever the game or the, the issue was, um, you know, that we were involved in, it was at that time of the year. Trading cards. Trading cards, um, yeah. flipping cards, all the different, the games that were played at that particular point in time were a very apportioned kind of a thing. And within that construct, um, I remember clearly the joy with which we watched new cement being poured yeah. on the one part of the block that um, had a hill on it, which meant that roller skating would soon take place on new concrete. Um, you know, those kinds of really warm memories yeah. of, um, of relatives, um, Aunt Lavinia, Uncle Joe coming uh, to visit. Um, mm. And my grandmother... You're describing a very joyous childhood. Was wonderful. Yeah. My grandmother would come uh, because they only lived about six blocks away on 89th Street. Um, sometimes there would be on a Sunday afternoon an impromptu gathering for the traditional Italian Sunday of church and then a meal that sometimes lasted six to eight hours. And it was not uncommon for that apartment to be filled with relatives who would just show up with a, a, a box of cannolis um, and sfogliadelle. Um, and there could be 20 or 25 people. The men would be outside or up on the roof smoking cigars, those incredibly horrible, wrinkled denobles <laughs> that stunk like heck. Um, and, uh, and ice cream and all kinds of good stuff and good weather or ices from the Stronconis yeah. and, and uh, that kind of a thing. All those kinds of memories. But good friends. You had a lot of adult influences then, other than your parents. Yes. It sounds like you had many people in your life to influence you. Yes. Who, was it your mother's influence that caused you to go into education then? From what I you think said? mom always, mom and dad always wanted me to, to go into education. Mm. One of the things that was truly there in their lives was the stability of mom's income and the, the zeniths and the nadirs of my dad's. Mm. Because one year there would be nothing but Th the finest cut of steaks on the table and four cars in the driveway and incredible successes, which could, you know, in that kind of an entrepreneurial world, yes. could easily result in, you know, the legs getting cut out from yes. the business, which happened. Yes. You know, there were times when things were incredibly tight, let's yes. put it that way. Um, and uh, I have very, very strong memories of those times. I think that at some point one of the influences was the continuous sense of um, what you can get out of giving this and the stability of the educational field. And that mm. was an influence. Yes, definitely. Did you have chores that you were responsible for in, in that part of that time of growing up? Or Yes. Um, it, it was not okay for um, me not to work, ever. I always remember er, from very, very early on doing jobs in the neighborhoods, having actual customers whose lawns I did or whose houses I worked in, etc. cetera. Um, but I also had a very, very extensive uh, paper route for the Long Island Press. Um, I worked with the manager as an assistant manager and Evening. You were you were an industrious kid then. Is that how you would describe yourself? It was or? a necessity. We we needed oh, the money. Okay, so you were helping and I out needed with the that. money. Yes. Okay. And there were times when it was just it was just the thing that you know I was involved in. Yeah. You know. What were you involved? What were you interested in as growing up? What were the kinds of things that? Well, first you? and foremost, um, I had been exposed very early on to being successful as a fisherman. My dad gave me a uh, um, uh, some twine it was. Uh, the, the typical story of uh, being at, I think it was a casino, in fact it was, a casino park in Queens, um, a picnic, a boiled up piece of um, bread from the inside of an Italian bread, either a bent pin or a hook and this um, kite string. And the next thing I knew, 
um, on the grass was this very large carp <laughs> that wow and there was all of the success of this yeah. so I very very early on became interested in fishing um, and very involved in that today um, presently president of the New York Sport Fishing uh, Federation here on Long Island. We have 45,000 members and their families. Um, and I am proud to be the founder of one of our most successful ventures, which is the Teach a Kid to Fish program. Um, we take individual students, youngsters, through a program of five or six stations at which they learn things like boating safety, fish identification, conservation methods, um, hook safety. And when they complete this program, they get a certificate, they get a lot of supplies, and they get a, a trip, which is um, one that they can go on with a parent. It fosters family unity, something I've been involved in my mm -hmm. entire life. It, mm -hmm. it puts mom and dad and the child in a place where they have a common interest. And this program is now uh, one that um, is receiving a lot of attention, even nationally, because we've put over 4,500 kids through this program in five years. Um, and it's a wonderful program. Uh, the, the Suffolk uh, representative for this program works here in Brentwood. That's Richie Salvatore, mm. um, this year's Man of the Year. He's done a tremendous job with this program. And uh, there's a whole cadre of volunteers from the Federation who have um, learned how rewarding it can be to not only be a fisherman, but to also teach children. And how important it is as a child to have an interest, because here's an example of exactly. one that has lasted a lifetime yes. and has borne fruit for other people Absolutely. as well. Besides uh, fishing, i um, very always been interested in the theater. Yes. When I came here to Brentwood, okay. I was the director of uh, several productions, uh, some of the very memorable ones. Um, Auntie Mame uh, was one. We had 160 students that were involved in yeah. our production of Auntie Mame, The Miracle Worker. Um, there was some really Amazing. magnificent times with uh, the kids in the theater, too. Speaking of theater, are you a night person or a day person? I'm an... I, I have always existed on very little sleep because really? of my energy level. I, you know, four, to ha four, four and a half hours of sleep, maybe wow. five hours of sleep is, is fine. I usually am up till 12, 30, 1 o'clock, um, up at 5, 30, quarter to 6 in the morning. And the one difference that is really, truly there between Loretta and myself is that I am um, a Phenomenal morning person. When I wake up, it's with Joie de Vivre. I'm, I'm singing all these songs, um, and she is moaning under the pillow. What if you don't stop singing doo-wop songs in the morning? <laughs> yeah. She's a four cup of, okay. of a couple of cups of coffee person in the morning, and I'm the yes. you know ready to go. Ready to go. You have a favorite season? Um. Fishing season, I know. But. Fishing season is the fall <laughs> because it, it is really such a, a, uh, a varied season for us here on Long Island mm -hmm. in terms of species to be out there. But I think that the, the kind of alternatives that we have just in terms of as an educator um, having a couple of weeks in the summer, the summer does prove to, mm -hmm. has proven to be a, a really mm -hmm. wonderful time. We live on the water. Um, I have a boat in the backyard kind of a situation. It was a dream of mine for years before. In fact, um, Loretta and I bought our first house uh, uh, about six or eight months before we were married as an investment because the opportunity came up. And with some friends, I worked on it until after we were married and moved in. Um, and it was a small on the water piece of property. And that was one of my dad's adv pieces of advice that was really wonderful. Don't rent, buy a piece of waterfront property if that's what you want, which proved to be a, a, a good, sound investment because we did well with that house and then were able to buy the house that we're in now. They say, if Frank, if, um, if you have one or two teachers that really make a difference in your life, you've been lucky. If you look back over your, your own educational experience, uh, what are the teachers that made a difference for you? There are two teachers that stand out in my mind. Um, the first one was a, a man at Chaminade High School um, whose name was Pat Stafford. He was my social studies teacher and he was my guidance counselor. And um, Chaminade proved to be a, a, a tremendous challenge. It was a difficult 
uh, uh, school in many ways because of the academic. <coughs> Had you been in public school prior to no, Chaminade? Oh. No, St. Mary's Roslyn. Okay. Um, excellent education. But Chaminade, for those yeah. folks that don't know, when you graduated from Chaminade, at least in the 50s and the 60s, um, it was with almost 40 high school credits. And you put in two and a half to three hours of written homework a night, you'd better put in another two and a half, three to survive. Um, you know, 28,000 boys applied to Chaminade High School. They took 350, and you were down to 300 um, within two, three, four months because mm. of the competition. And uh, Christian brothers, weren't they? Marianists. Marianists. Oh, oh. Marianists. Um, okay. A very tough road to home. Mm. Um, but I did well in my English classes, loved uh, any of the ones oriented to foreign language and literature, and struggled through the math classes because of the level of difficulty. And honestly, that was not, mm. I was a reader. You know, I was reading, in addition to the work, I'd read five or six novels a week, but math was yeah. not my, has never been my forte, and that's, I'm sure, um, friends who know me mm -hmm. who were watching this would say, yeah, an understatement, Frank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and following that experience with that teacher who had a profound effect, was Pat there Stafford was um, an inspirational man. Um, very, very, uh, the quality that made him a good teacher was one that I tried to incorporate into my own style later on. Okay. Um, if one student in Mr. Stafford's class didn't understand what he had just said, it was a requirement in his class that you raise your hand and say, Mr. Stafford, I don't understand. He said to us, if one of you don't get it, you can be assured that there's someone else sitting here who doesn't get it. Your responsibility is to tell me, and I will explain it again until everyone understands it. We moved at a rapid pace, but it was always with a sense of, as a student, you knew what you knew. Mm. And you knew what you didn't know. Mm. And in his class, there were no mysteries. Because when the test came up, if you studied the material, you did well. Mm. And there was a real sense of reward with, with that kind of a system. The other individual was Bill Church. Bill Church was um, my cooperating teacher. And if God ever destined me to become an educator, it was because... I ended up in his classroom. Um, to say that the population that we had was tough is an understatement. Um, one of the first things that happened to me after I had taken over this classroom was that as I was in the midst of putting something on the board, a throwing knife ended up in the cork board. And I turned around and took the knife out of the cork board and walked down the row to the one student in the classroom who was being not looked at, he put it on his desk and said, I think you dropped something. And that student and I became fast friends because he knew that I had met the challenge and responded to it correctly. And, um, and you had no discipline problems. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, he really was a um, the leader of the what now would be considered to be, in a much more formalized way, the gang. Yeah. And yeah. he had challenged me. I'd responded to it. Once that young man and I had established that bond, um, I was in. A great experience to have before you came to Brentwood. Yes. And you arrived in Brentwood in the mid-60s. Yes. Uh, I think you said a 66 or there. That's correct. And you've told us why. And you've told us, you've taken us through your initial, some of the initial steps of uh, interview and so on. Who did you work with back then, Frank? Who were some of the people you worked with? Um, George Pittman had a philosophy that was, I'm going to train these people to become the best of the best. Um, the by and large of his choices were people right out of college. So going to, to East Junior High School on orientation day, John, was kind of awesome because I walked in, uh, I can assure you that I don't weigh the 121 pounds that I did then. Mm -hmm. 
um, and looked at a huge number of folks right out of college, one or two years, were the veterans. Um, there was uh, staff members that are still here that I have made friends with, um, and they are still my friends 33 years later. Tommy Martin was a social studies teacher um, who was in Brentwood for a few years and then went to, um, to Walt Whitman as a guidance counselor, mm. one of my um, two brothers, okay, um, that I didn't have is he. Um, people who were inspirational to me, um, and I shared a tremendous amount of uh, my professional time with, Richie Hutner, Galen Zarillo, um, Helene Jarmol, um, folks that were uh, great teachers, people that that, you know, cared about kids. And um, there were a lot of us that lost friends along the way yes, because sure. they moved on, and et cetera. But those are some of the folks that were there. Take us through your own career path um, because there were many changes to affect yes. where you worked and who you worked with right. in the years to come. Uh, after uh, the, the first uh, three years, George Pittman... Um, uh, had moved on, and he subsequently came back over to West, as the history of Brentwood will tell us. Uh, Tar Marcello was there. Steve Howland became the principal of the building. Uh. Um, I worked for Steve Howland as an uh, as the guidance counselor, uh, as a guidance counselor for him for a number of years. Um, in 1974, um, I was hired as an assistant principal uh, by Mr. DiPietro, assigned to the seventh grade center with John Galaris and mm -hmm. and um, Chuck Puglio as the principal. Um, I was there for several years and then moved back over at Mr. Howland's request to come back to East as his assistant principal. I spent quite a few years as the assistant principal in charge of curriculum and instruction mm -hmm. at East, which was really a joy. I did no discipline. Um, not that I couldn't, but I really had sunk my teeth into um, if I could could be so bold as say helping teachers to become the best teachers that they could be, uh, the luxury was to be able to say to um, a Joan Thorpe, okay, Joan Hayden Thorpe, God rest her soul, yes. um, one of our dear departed friends, um, Frank, I I I've, I want to work through this um, unit on um, symbolism and and uh, the animal world. Could you come in? Sure, what period? Uh, fifth period. Um, how many weeks? Okay, I'll come in for two weeks, fifth period. So I had the luxury of being there yes. for a week to plan with her, work oh. through the entire thing, um, teach with her for those two weeks, to be involved in the actual process, um, and then to be able to do things like we're doing here, tape lessons, um, bring somebody else in, set it up so that two teachers could What accounted time. for the luxury? My job functioning was curriculum and instruction. The whole functioning of 116 and the disciplinary process was high, was handled by folks like Joe Silva and Mark Nizowitz um, uh, okay. along the way. So that okay. Steve Howland's concept was he did not want that tainted. Yes. He wanted his, his assistant principal for curriculum and instruction to be involved in ordering supplies, ordering the materials, working with the staff, doing all of the observations, being involved with hiring and um, mm. unfortunately the firing process um, and ensuring that the entire instructional processes within the school um, were handled by one person. So it was a wonderful place to be. Um, in, many, in many ways, Steve's faith in me included, you do it. You, you know, let me know, keep me informed, let's talk about it, um, ensure the fact that there's a sense of communication, but I want to know what it is you're planning that would include, you know, we were involved in projects like team teaching, block teaching, um, group work, uh, higher order thinking skills, things that were like in the, in plus, the days to come, you know. Uh, I will also add that plus at, at East, you developed a, a very tightly knit professional family uh, feeling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It was the family away from our family. Yeah. Still there in many cases. Yes, yes. There are some, the, the, our constraints here are with time, and there are so many things I want to ask. And so if I move too fast, you pull me back. But what I want to do is to get a feeling for 
also at the same time that you were working with staff and you were working uh, in various uh, job descriptions, you were also moving along professionally in your own um, time given to the organization um, that you were a member of at that time. Can you talk a little bit about, about sure. those steps? Um, was a very, very staunch uh, supporter and member of the, the Brentwood Teachers Association. Uh, was the building rep for, I think right in the beginning, one of the building reps was um, shortly on the, the board was grievance chairman for two years, three years, I believe, um, negotiator for a couple of years um, with Jack Zuckerman and Matty Dwyer and um, mm -hmm. Tom Brush, mm -hmm. people that were on that particular negotiating team. Um, when I became an administrator, uh, I was asked to continue my um, ability to help out in that venue within the structure of BIPSO. Uh, I became the president of BIPSO for a couple of years and um, hoped that whatever we were able to do was influential there. So I was very active in all of the professional organizations. I was elected to be the uh, Suffolk County representative to the School Administrators Association as a director and served Saney's as a director for um, I think it was eight or nine years. Saney's is? School Administrators Association of New York State. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I want to mention some individuals and have you respond to your memories. You've already referred to Guy Di Pietro. Yes. Um, what can you say? What can anyone say? God, there, there are very, very few people who I think influenced a community the way that Mr. Di Pietro did. Um, he, he had one of those personalities and personas and intelligences that um, are just, they're, they're just legendary. He, he was a motivator. Um, he was a thinker and a planner. Uh, I think he was one of the first people in my life that I really realized, you know something? He mentioned something about this three years ago, and now it just, you, know, you wouldn't see it. You would not see the capacity of this man to make things happen in the future the way that he really had a sense of foresight and he really cared about the staff and the kids in a very very important way um, i hate frank to single anyone out it's so unfair i just did that and i realized to to no, leave anybody all, out uh, but he was so significant yeah, to, to yeah. all of us here in brentwood yes. Uh, yes. it would be it would be absurd to do so you know okay. um, i'm sure that when we look back on the careers of people like him and Mr. Black and other individuals, how can you leave them out? Even the impact that he had on structuring negotiations from then yep. on. Yeah, and the construction of that teacher's contract, you know, which is um, probably a, uh, if, you w if we went back to what was originally constructed, and I remember working on him, for example, I wrote the uh, professional growth section of that contract and I fought for it and, even though he was against it, when I presented to him the need for professional growth and the ability for our staff um, to be able to attend conferences and look at the, with him the kinds of changes that were occurring within um, the educational community, not just here in Brentwood, but throughout the United States. And when I made that presentation to him and he listened to the logic of it, he said, there isn't any question we're going to create a fund. And we want our administrators to go out and, and to become knowledgeable. And it was that kind of foresight and ability to, you know, move off the dime, if you will, that and, marked his... And to take the adversarial nature of negotiations out of the picture. Yes. Yeah. At times. Yeah. It was, he was a tough negotiator. That, oh, that, no, no doubt about that. That, that there was... I'm, no, I'm talking in terms of the scale and how salaries are arrived at oh, and so on. Yeah, I mean, there was, once, once you'd We've been... We've never had a strike. The, right. Came close, but came close. we didn't. Came close the year that uh, that um, there was a real sense of well, how shall I put this gently? Um, not so gently. There were men members of the community who had taken over the school board who were not yes. really interested in education and educators. They were adversarial individuals, yes. and they managed to somehow rather gain control for a short period of time. And those people, like Tony Felicio, who had um, the best interests of the district at heart were not 
uh, unfortunately, in control of the decision-making processes, mm -hmm. those were tough times. Yes, yes. Because those people were out there with, was some damage. With, and they other, did. with other agendas, as you yes, said. Yes, other agendas is a good <clears throat> way of putting it. Um, your definition of union has uh, changed over the years, or it hasn't changed? My definition of union always had as it, at its core um, care protection. Okay. And I don't think that that's changed yes. very much. Um, the, the histrionics may change, and the venue may change in which the histrionics take place, and they may be um, more or less uh, visible. But they were there then. They just had a different way of being yes. processed. And, and I think that there have been individuals in Brentwood who have dedicated their lives to ensuring the fact that the union did the best for its teachers and for its administrators. We've had a, a succession of strong and caring leadership in this district um, from administration right straight through the yes. union that has been... Uh, you may not like the individual, you may not like some of the things that the individual mm -hmm. does at times, but you'd have to stand back from the 30 years that I've yes. been here and say, in other districts, these men and women would have been um, incredibly influential people. Yeah. And that's why there was such representation yeah. for years. Jack Zuckerman, um, Guy, all of different people that were involved, um, representing all of the different unions were very significant people. In so many ways, Brentwood is unique, and in so many ways, Brentwood is a microcosm of the larger community. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact, or refer to the fact, that things tend to happen here first, including the bad things. I'm taking for granted the good things happen here first. But there are also some uh, horrific things like the takeover at East Junior High. Yes. What, what are your memories, or what, are, what, did, what did you take with that? What was the legacy for you of that experience? I worked with you in that building for that, that year and was present for that event, um, a life-changing event. It was that. Um, I have learned that in my lifetime, for whatever reason, whatever you know, manifest destiny or whatever it is that we would call it. Um, if God has asked me to be there, he's asked me to be there. Um, and who expected on a day in which I'm working on my budgets at my desk at 11 o'clock in the morning um, to spend the rest of the next 12, 15 hours um, mm -hmm. at with a gun to my forehead, mm -hmm. and the, under, the other end of which is somebody who was fading in and out of reality, yes. and who kept playing with the trigger. You know, but that's, you, you say to yourself, this is not what I planned on oh. for lunch oh. today. This is not what I planned on doing today. Um, I remember with clarity the, the expression on the faces of the police officers who were trapped um, in the hallway, who he, um, Bob, Unfortunately, had lost his mind and, and trans, you know, gone across the lines of, of being able to be in the real world and the horrible world of pain that he was in. On several occasions, he had he had caught one particular officer that I knew personally who would respond at school, and he caught him in the middle of the hallway, um, and he had him dead to rights in his sights, 10 feet away, the gun trained right on his head. And I stepped between the gun and, and the, and the um, officer and said, no more killings, no more shootings, and escorted the officer into the classroom that he was trying to get into. That happened twice, that I actually had to stand in front of a police officer who had been trapped by him because he would snuck out and been in a different location. Um, the, the expressions on the kids' faces, um, having watched their classmate be shot, twice, once in the hand, once in the, in the abdomen, um, knowing that they were being held hostage, the helicopters that originally came yeah, by, and yeah. you know the rest yes. of it. Um, and then, of course, the tragedy of Bob taking his own life. Yes. yes. Um, I think one of the things that I look back on, and, and I, I understand it to some degree, but I, I was a little bit, um, at the time, 
taken aback by the reaction of trying to make this go away that the district took. Um, Back to normal. Yeah, and right I don't know how you can do that. How yeah. do you make believe that yes. this didn't happen? How yes. do you just not say to the press that, you know, Frank Carnese was in this room? How do you make believe that, you know, Steve Howland hadn't been shot? How That's do you right. just, you know, that kind of stunned me. Um, I think it comes I, under uh, the heading of denial, I think. Yes, a gross denial. Gross um, denial. But the rest of the country had to learn from our experience. That is true. And I look back now and I see this rash of violence that took place. Yeah. Um, and I and I from coast to coast. And John, it it scares me when I see headlines that say no signs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no signs. I know. Or was Forgive no one me for laughing, attention. but it is. It's ludicrous. It is ludicrous. Yeah. We have to become much more attuned to what it is that our students are telling us, and much more attuned to the personal response, because it's only um, the word of encouragement, the recognition by first name, yes. the ability of someone to say, I do have time. I don't have time, but I will make time. Um, Frank, what scares me is the absence of compassion in a lot of the new standards and demands for ev on everybody's shoulders. Not that they're a bad thing. Anyway, no, that's okay because it's you, you. You know, let's let's spend the thirty seconds with that. Here's what I'm afraid of, and I and I say this with a real sense of of approbation and a sense of fear. I think that the, the new standards really are important, and I think that we need to go about that with the same sense of diligence of making sure that those folks who have the abilities to achieve them are there, but to not provide an alternative for those students who legitimately can't is a dangerous thing. Uh, it is a predictable entity to be able to say that there are going to be students who, despite their best efforts, are not going to pass, never can pass, a six-hour, two-day English exam. And those students are going to be doomed to be non-graduates. And if we are experiencing in our country today a sense of frustration level to which students are responding with a sense of violence, now, what are they going to experience when they have spent 12 or 13 or 14 years trying to get a degree and now find out that they are being told that they will always be second-class citizens, they'll never have great jobs, they'll never go to college, and they're never going to graduate. And no one has said to them, okay, you're not going to make it, but we want you to know that your ability to be a carpenter or to be someone who is in charge of the recreational community at this in this community. You, you can work with young kids in this capacity. You're going to be able to be an entrepreneur. You are, as a, a young woman, going to be able to pursue a career in nursing. Okay, you're not going to be an RN, but you are going to be a PN. We're going to put you in a place where we're yes. going to help you. We're going to yes. test you. We're going to yes. encourage you. We're going to find a way for you to become successful yes. in some other means yes. and fashion. And that's not in place now. Yeah. And no one is talking about the okay. effect. that's going. We're, we're talking about gangs taking over. We're talking about a country in which um, gang violence is up in urban and suburban and, and rural areas. We're talking about 12 and 13 year olds blowing away teachers and um, what are we going to do with these young men and women who in some cases have no family, right. no support system at home, right. and the only support system out there is a world filled with violence and drugs and gang activity. And as a non-graduate, yeah. somebody who is predictably not going to become one of the elite where and how does that person, what, what else do they do? I'm, I'm fearful of that for us for the future. You have accomplished a great many things in your 33 three years. What are you most proud of? Without a doubt, the fact that repetitively throughout the years, there have been students who have come back and said to me, you have been able to influence my life because you believed in me. Now that may have been as an administrator, it may have been because I was, even as an administrator, as you well know, I taught an English class mm -hmm. at East for about 
seven or eight years with Marilyn Flamberg. Mm -hmm. um, our, our class every day was filled with kids who were capable of only seeing themselves in, in uh, and I think many kids do, very limited potential. The thing that, that will come back to me and stay with me is the most enriching is the fact that I, at the tender age of 54, can tell you that I still have now lifelong friends who were students of mine back in my very first classes. Wonderful. Um, we spent Wonderful. a weekend with um, a young lady who visited Loretta and I, uh, Suzanne Costalos, who is a graduate of Brentwood High School, um, a star of stage and screen, also now gone back and got her own degree in social work. Oh, great, um, great story, great. And other uh, students who are involved in different kinds of, Jill Doherty is an auctioneer here in Long Island. Um, that's neat. Also, a, a, a whole cadre of them that I have had as lifelong friends and the ability of these people to say, this was a person who helped me become the best person that I could be. Well, then you could also say, mission accomplished. Yes, I can. Okay. Your last assignment has been here in the Ross building? Yes. Um, we have this, this system of, you know, the, the, the Mr. O'Brien being the principal of the, the building and as the assistant principal in charge of the um, Ross building, it's been a wonderful, I've always wanted to have, you know, even though it's, like I said, it's not uh, um, uh, the, the full experience, but to be the assistant principal for the Ross Building has given me the opportunity to, you know, tr truly experience my leadership abilities and to have my own building and to be able to, in many ways, influence um, the staff and the students, I hope, in a positive way, to commit to themselves to be uh, more peaceful to ensure the fact that some of the policies that we had talked about and put in here are affected, um, including no violence, mm -hmm. um, including the fact that you are required to come to school on time or you don't go to first period class, you don't interrupt that educational process, yeah. um, to work with this incredible staff of administrators, Mark Fink, um, Gail Swenson, uh, Bill Condon, Cease Harrisburg, um, Marianne Labrizzi, um, who am I leaving out? I think I got everybody. Um, just the great staff of administrators. Um, and to, to have been worked with all of the administrative staff here has been just terrific. The Ross Center staff, um, if I leave a legacy of any kind, they are caring and dedicated teachers. They are absolutely wonderful people, and I wish them to just continue that legacy for the future. You're a fortunate man, uh, Frank, to have had the the uh, career and, uh, and the experience that you have. I am unfortunate in the sense that I have run out of time to ask you so many other questions. Uh, we haven't even touched upon your own professional outside of school uh, private practice that you have continued and will probably take a step uh, to immerse yourself more seriously in once having left here. You've decided to leave at the end of this year. 1999 will be the year of your um, redirection yes um, is there anything and I'm going to ask you this as a final question because we have no further time to go uh, beyond unfortunately is there anything that you um, have in your sights that you would like to do as soon as you have closed the book on your professional life here the gift that I think I want to share is my ability to communicate with other individuals the capacity for them to make changes in their lives and to become the best that they can be. If I have the ability to do that as a public speaker, I plan on um, uh, pursuing that potential, whether it's through workshops and seminars in the business world or in the educational field. That's what I'd like to be able to do. I think it's a unique combination, if you will, John, in conclusion. Um, I've been a therapist um, as a psychiatric social worker since 1985. Prior to that, I had a family practice since 1968, um, a very viable um, and incredibly uh, enriched training uh, through Adelphi University's um, uh, very, very intensive program that I, I received a, a full scholarship to after the, the shooting incident. Um, I graduated with uh, a perfect 4.0 average from that program. Um, I uh, brought 
to that program, I think, a lot that made it the success that it was. I, I was the leader of those individuals, had been asked to do that. Um, my, my practice has um, given me a very, very true perspective in terms of what people can do um, when they I'll set their minds yes. to it. To be an educator with the very background that you have so generously helped me to illuminate here today um, gives me the capacity to say, I know what it's like to be in a classroom with 21 boys whose backgrounds made them be extremely needy individuals. Of course, Brentwood has given us the opportunity to be with students of every ethnic and, yes. and various social economic background, which is a very enriched experience. So the combination of being a therapist, to be a um, educator, uh, of a teacher, um, a counselor, and an administrator, puts me, I think, in a situation to say, hey, I've also been one of the individuals intimately involved in, in one of the most violent, unfortunately, one of the first and very violent incidents in a school. I can help you to put yourselves in a venue where a lot of what it is that was in the headlines need not occur here because, bluntly, the headline of no signs of what was to come isn't true. The signs were there, you just didn't see them. That's right. And um, to instill a sense of community in schools, to help the teachers and the administrators and the students to communicate well is something that I think I can help them to do. So I'm hopeful that um, that is a possible, we'll have a sense of fruition, um, and that's a career.